Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. Dr. Ioannidis, Dr. Bhattacharya, this is a super big honor for me to have you guys here. Thanks for being here. The honor is mine. Thank yes. you for the kind invitation. Um, you guys are both professors at Stanford, but uh, it's, it's a little unusual for you guys to be together, right? You, you guys do different things and work on different projects. Is that fair to say? Pretty much. I, I think I know Jay for a number of years. Uh, We've worked before the pandemic, but uh, uh, on a, a couple of projects together. I, I, it's during the pandemic where now John is my brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or wow. Friend. There's, yeah. Um, there's like three or four of you maybe in the world that agreed? I think, I actually think there were a lot more people that agreed with us than it appears. Yeah. Uh, what would they agree on? Because I think that we disagree on a lot of things. We do we disagree on a lot of things. That's <laughs> true. Uh, I mean, you get two scientists together in a room, you'll get two opinions. That's the norm. Yeah. Um, That's uh, pretty normal. Yeah. And uh, expected and healthy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, but but it's the consensus around lockdowns, John. I don't I don't think that there actually was a true consensus. There was a, an appearance of one, but not not an actual one. I mean, you wrote a, a piece very early on in the pandemic, arguing that we needed a better empirical basis for deciding whether there ought to be a lockdown. So, so did I. Um, I think a lot of scientists were thinking that way. I, I think a lot of us just had no clue what we were facing. At, at least this is what I felt, that I was uh, in the middle of a situation where we had very limited evidence. The evidence that we had already seemed to have lots of problems. Yeah. Uh, we had to make monumental decisions. I, I fully respect the precautionary principle. So in fact, I was one of the fervent supporters of lockdown, at least for a short term, at least until we found out what was going on. But um, I think that we were all agreeing that we needed to get better evidence yeah. and work with that evidence to try to eliminate both the harm from the virus that was spreading and the harm that we could do from our own actions. At, at least that's my narrative, but maybe I'm, I'm wrong or maybe we disagree. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, early on, I was, uh, I'm a health policy person, a health econ economist by training. Um, I, I, uh, my first thoughts were on the harms of the lockdown. Um, and so I, 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 mean, I was fairly skeptical that it was going to be justified. You'd have to uh, have an extraordinary mix of, of scientific facts to make it justified. Um, but I didn't know whether those facts were true or not. I wanted to know. Just so just like John, I think, I, I was uncertain about some key things, like uh, how, how deadly really is the disease, how, how rapidly does it spread. I, I thought we needed to know basic facts like that b before we launched into this extraordinary policy we launched into. Yeah, Jay, we talked about this last time, but you're, you're not just an epidemiologist. You're an economist as well, which, which gives you multiple perspectives to view this. And and I just read your article that you published on March 17th, 2020, which I guess is the article that got you in trouble. And <laughs> maybe one of many. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, maybe, maybe that was the first one, but uh, um, my perspective, and I think we talked about this last time, Jay, was as an economist, I was, I was immediately thinking about supply chains and, and this infinitely complex process by which people feed each other and take care of each other and and heat their homes or cool their homes and all of that stuff and and I, I didn't know anything about epidemiology I still don't although I pretend to now which is very important um, um, but I knew that you can't just turn off the economy and turn it back on and this would have dire health consequences you were worried about about data um, and making big decisions the way I read that article um, was we don't have enough information to make such draconian decisions. Is that a fair characterization? I, th I think it's a fair reading, uh, and I think it's important to look at the full article because sometimes people take one or another phrase or half a sentence or a couple of sentences or a paragraph in isolation, and uh, they tend to create narratives out of this uh, based on what they believe or what their ideology might be. And I, I think that in such situations of crisis, it's important to try to be balanced, uh, not to delay action, uh, quite the opposite. And action includes collecting reliable data, but revisit 
actions based on the evolving evidence. There was a lot at stake. We realize that even better now because a, a lot of things have happened. Uh, we have lost an, a huge number of, of people uh, to the virus and also to the measures that, that we took. And we have devastated uh, various aspects of, of our life. We have devastated education. We have devastated um, uh, even health care. We have uh, devastated the prospects of uh, people who are disadvantaged. So there was a lot at stake. And I, I think that uh, I'm not saying this to blame anyone. Uh, I feel like a complete idiot in terms of how to react in that situation in the absence of data. But it, it was important to try to keep calm and try to respond with science, uh, with the strengths and acknowledging the limitations of science. Yeah. Um, give us a little bit of your background. I've, I've sort of launched into this conversation, but uh, why do people, can, at least before the pandemic, you, you were considered one of the guys. Like, you knew your stuff, and you're highly cited, highly high respected in your industry, and um, suddenly you became a bad guy. But you used to be a good guy, right? Still um, a good guy. I, I think <laughs> I was always a bad guy for some people and a good guy for others. I yeah. think this, this has continued. Uh, I, and uh, I'm proud for both. <laughs> and I, I wish well to both people who love me and people who hate me. I think that uh, criticism in science is uh, very welcome. The, the type of work that I do unavoidably places me in some interface of friction because uh, some of my work is looking at the reproducibility of uh, scientific findings, at the ability to replicate uh, research, at issues of transparency, at issues of conflicts, at issues of uh, reliability. Uh, so very quantitative assessments, sometimes uh, very boringly so for people who hate math and statistics, looking at how likely are different pieces of evidence or different claims of discovery to be correct? And what is the margin of error? What is the margin of uncertainty surrounding our findings? So some of my work, unfortunately, <laughs> or, or fortunately, had concluded that there are many areas of, uh, of scientific investigation that have plenty of room for error. Uh, number one, my own research, <laughs> yeah. of course. And uh, there's also ways that we can improve transparency, reproducibility, reliability, useful research at the end of the day, making a difference for people, especially when it comes to medicine. It's not about just the curiosity of whether some remote galaxy is so many light years away. It's, it's about saving lives and improving people's lives in, in all the dimensions of what it means to have a good life. Yeah. So it, it's things that matter, and I think that there are ways that we can improve people's lives. We can improve people's lives at the individual level for single people, and at the level of populations, at the level of society, at uh, the level of public health. So the, the challenge of the pandemic really brought to focus all of these aspects in, in a way. Plus it was an infectious disease and my background training is <laughs> in infectious disease sadly. So it, it, it was uh, unavoidably yeah. the case that I had to react. I had to start looking at that issue as so many other scientists did. Now, as, as I recall your, your history, you were um, one of the first to question um, Theranos and, and some of their data or lack thereof. Is that accurate? That was uh, the case. Uh, I, I wrote the first uh, uh, paper in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association that questioned Theranos and their strategy and their technology. At that time, they had a valuation of $9 billion, and uh, uh, they were very famous. Their CEO was uh, getting one accolade uh, after another, and uh, they were thought to be disrupting everything in health and healthcare and society and diagnostic testing and medicine and everything that you can imagine. So I wrote that piece that was very skeptical, and I said, I see no evidence. They have published nothing in the peer-reviewed literature, and uh, I really don't know. Uh, what they propose as an idea actually doesn't make sense to me. Just testing people massively, if they're okay, Mm -hmm. is not something that uh, tends to have favorable outcomes. We just create problems that don't exist. Sometimes we find problems that exist and we, we're not aware of, but it's more frequent to create problems by over-testing, and same applies to over-medicalizing or, or over 
uh, stressing medicine in in society. So th- that was a hard time <laughs> for me. Yeah, and, uh, I was going to say those. That's a that's a big uh, <laughs> um, that's a big enemy to take on. Uh, of course, so I I got phone calls from the the general counsel asking me to recant uh, uh, at some point, saying that well, why don't you recant and write uh, another piece with our CEO? Uh, saying that I recant and now I have seen the light and uh, <laughs> everything seems uh, splendid and perfect. And I, I remember that I had that conversation with uh, with Theranos uh, in Rome. I, I was giving a, a series of lectures there and uh, I, I was outside the Tempietto of Bramante, which is a Renaissance masterpiece. It's a small temple in an inner courtyard surrounded by a bigger church Unless you are in that courtyard, you cannot see anything. Now, if you are inside, if you're an insider, then you can see the light, you can see the, the glory of the Renaissance, you can see one of the, the masterpieces of, of uh, uh, architecture of all times. It, it felt a little bit like that when they were telling me that, you know, if you become an insider, uh, you will see the glory. Uh, but I was an outsider, and I, I love to be an outsider. I, I don't like to feel that... Uh, I belong to parties or, or partisan clubs or, or preferred uh, <laughs> sections of society or business or whatever. And I, I try to be objective and say, well, this is what I see. If you want me to be convinced, I need to see the evidence. I need to see the data. So COVID-19 was pretty similar in that regard because, again, we had to see the data. We had to see the evidence to see what are we doing and where are we heading. So you, now I take this back. You really are the bad guy. You like to, you <laughs> like to be the outsider. We like you, to use the word fringe. Man. Yeah, yeah. Being an outsider, you're free, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but by the way, you just characterized my entire critique of of the um, public health response to COVID. Was it was insiders talking to insiders, and it became an echo chamber, and which is why I think you were both demonized. Were you were you such a troublemaker, Jay, before? I mean, no, no one could really be as much of a troublemaker as John. Um, I, I, um, but I also was on the outside. I mean, I was in the. I was a professor of medicine at Stanford Medical School, so it's it's uh, about as it sounds like it's on the inside as you can be. But within that environment, I'm an economist. I have an MD, but I don't I don't practice medicine full time. I I write papers. I tend to weigh in on health policy issues where. I'm giving the health health economists perspective on public health topics, and so that automatically made me an outsider before the pandemic. Although not nearly as controversial as John, I think. Um, so I wasn't I wasn't quite as used to the 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 uh, the level of of scrutiny. Not well, scrutiny is not the right word. Like re- the level of, of of stress that comes with being on the fringe, as I think maybe John was during the pandemic. Yeah, you. Um I, I'm gonna. I want to push back a little bit on the precautionary principle, as I understand it, um, because I think it ignores things outside of the narrow field of, in this case, epidemiology. And you're you're focused on one problem: a virus, and perhaps a very deadly virus we don't know yet. Um, but I, I would I would argue that that someone like Anthony Fauci didn't consider. The damage to school children by not letting them go to school for now almost two years. He didn't consider the economics of people at the margins, at the lowest rungs of society, not being able to, to feed their families. And I, I think that that is catastrophically bad healthcare policy. Well, the, the way I would characterize it, um, you can you have some uncertainty about how bad the virus is. You may, maybe some certain features of the of the virus that, that are that you just you just don't know. It's March 2020, February 2020. You just don't know about it. Uh, I think what the precautionary principle allows you to do is assume pretty close to the worst about the virus, but it doesn't allow you to assume pretty close to the best about the the knock on consequences of the response that you give. You're not allowed to assume that if you shut society down, you're not going to harm children, you're not going to harm the poor, you're not going to harm the working class, that you're just not allowed to do that. You can assume the worst about the virus, but you need to compare that still against what you know is very likely to be the consequences of the policies you follow. Yeah. I think, I think it's, a, it's a tough choice, and it's a very tough uh, balancing act. And uh, 
in the beginning when you're faced with something new, I, I think that anyone can make very wild guesses about all of these factors, all of these parameters, all of these potential repercussions. I, I have to say my feeling is that we were all surprised. Uh, I, I feel that uh, personally I was humbled again and again by how volatile the evidence was. Uh, never enough uh, and always more than enough <laughs> yeah. and overwhelming at the same time concurrently and trying to make sense of that evidence in real time while people are dying and while people are suffering and while people are marginalized and while people lose uh, their position in education, in, in social standing, in, in, in what their life is worth. So I, I don't think that uh, one should blame you know, public health or you know, specific public health officials or, or, or dignitaries uh, that uh, they, they completely missed the boat. Uh, probably they did. Uh, but goodness, it, it was such a crisis, such a multidimensional crisis, that making errors, just making tons of errors, was something that had to be anticipated. Yeah. The, the only thing is whether one could still remain open to say, oh goodness, I've made thousands of errors, I'm talking about myself, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I still try to be open to possibilities, yeah. to correct these errors and to probably have some better result tomorrow. See, that's how science is supposed to work. Th this is how science evolves and, yeah. and science hopefully does get it right eventually. But sometimes it takes 200 years to get <laughs> it right or 2,000 years to get it right. And in a pandemic, we don't have that time frame. We, we need to get it right immediately. And worse, there's lots of people who are certain that, yeah. that they know. Thank you for joining me today on Kibbe on Liberty and for being part of our fiercely independent audience. Every week, my organization, Free the People, partners with Blaze TV to bring you this show. My guests bring smart perspectives on everything from current events to timeless philosophical debates. If you like what you hear, go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and support Kibbe on Liberty so we can continue to produce these honest conversations with interesting people. Now, let's get back to it. Well, that, that, that's the, it's, it's a trap perhaps to, to thinking that you have to get it right immediately. And, and I, I, would, I would not necessarily critique, well, I will critique individuals unlike you, but, but what I'm really upset about is the one size fits all absolute certainty with which the public response was imposed. Um, and I think um, the credibility of science today would be in much better shape if our um, highest profile public officials said, there's so much we don't know here, but here's what we think is going on today. I would have preferred a decentralized response instead of when everybody is coerced into taking the same response and it's wrong, it can be catastrophic. I think that uh, we have to be cautious about what is decentralized and what is centralized because you can have decentralized responses that are run with lack of evidence just in the same way. Mm -hmm. And they're even more fragmented and they're even more confusing because someone crosses the, the boundary of a county, uh, which is just a few steps, <laughs> right. and you have a completely different response, completely different rules. People start thinking, well, what is science? Science is telling me to do that, but now it's telling me not to do this. Well, I, mean, so I, th I think the thing is, you, you, we did have a decentralized response in exactly that sense, right? Not just the United States, but different countries had Everywhere. different policies, um, and uh, th that's just a fact about the way the world is. Th it's we don't have a world government that could Im could impose a central one ones, and it wouldn't be right. Like diff the right policy in, in Bangladesh is going to be very different than the right policy in in Santa Clara County, California, uh, and so. The, the, uh, I think the idea that you could have a single policy a, where you, the world just shuts down for two weeks or whatever, whatever it is was never realistic. And it was premised on this fantasy about coordination between governments, coordination between public health agencies. Um, and it was premised, I think, on, I agree with you, Matt, too much certainty about, about uh, certain facts that were not not in not in evidence as yet. Yeah, the, you know the example I like to use. Um, you know, everybody likes to pick on now former governor Andrew Cuomo, um, but the the policies that the government of New York pursued in terms of of managing hospital flow, um, they they said basically if you don't have COVID, you can't come to the hospital. 
And they were looking at New York City, which at the time was was overrun with COVID cases. But that policy applied to um, suburban Buffalo, New York at the same time. And when I, when I think about a, a more decentralized response, I want to trust um, the local healthcare leaders and the people on the ground, to, to some, particularly when it's as much an economic question about how what's your bed capacity and what are the tools you have to take care of people because what was going on in Buffalo was very different. So I'm, I'm, I'm more decentralized than you are because the, the problems with decentralization may in fact be less so than a completely centralized solution that's wrong. I, I could use a, a different term that overlaps to some extent with decentralized. I, I would say another term would be participatory. So having people participate, having people yeah. b- being convinced or feeling confident that they're not misled, that they know what is to be known and they have the right amount of uncertainty. And at some point, probably uncertainty is really a lot and people should just try to deal with it. That, yeah. that Sorry, we don't know, <laughs> yeah. as you, you said at the very beginning. We're trying to learn. Uh, you know, We try to do our best, but there's lots of things that we don't know. I think if we do that, then we allow for a maximum share of the population to participate, to share, to care right. about other human beings. Yeah. We, we are all in the same boat. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not trying to save one fraction of the population, but condemn or or throw away another fraction of the population, regardless of what their ideology might be, regardless of whether we we agree on political parties or on uh, basketball teams or or whatever. I try to be good to everyone. Mm -hmm. And I I think that this is important about public health, to to gain the trust of as many people as possible, to show that it cares, to show that it cares about all the dimensions of their well-being. It's not just a single virus, it's all the aspects of their health. It's their spirituality, it's uh, their physical activity, it is their education, it's their creativity, it is their work, it is whether they can survive a a harsh winter. It's lots of things that unfortunately we just didn't pay attention to. We, We just paid too much attention on measuring a couple of things like number of cases, for example, yeah. RT-PCR tests, yeah. and left most of public health in, in the fringe. This is kind of connected to your critique of Theranos, right? So if you're, if you're going to be measuring repeatedly in a population um, of people who mostly don't have the disease, you're going to end up focusing attention on that thing, or yeah. you'll get false positives, and you'll just, it, it'll create more trouble than it solves. Than, than it solves. I mean, I think that that's... Uh, uh, especially when all of, of society decide that, like the, the the media, the public health messaging, the the fact of the shutdowns, it concentrated everybody's mind on this one problem, and and we had to pretend as if none of the other problems that humans face existed. Uh, but of course, we know that that's not true. That there's so many problems people have that they that they need to be able to solve, um, and it's never right. I mean, it's hard to think of a time when it might be right to only focus on one thing, the prevention of one single infectious disease. Yeah, I wonder if, like, the I, I like the way that you describe um, in, engaging the community in this process because, I, like, I, I assume we're all shocked at the tribal sort of hateful way that there's now two teams and you're either 100% good guy or you're 100% bad guy depending on which team you're sitting on. And I, I feel like this was probably caused by a centralized, one-size-fits-all, um, you, know, you know, claiming that the science is settled, I am the science, all these, all these now infamous comments, um, that, that pushed people into camps, and that's precisely the wrong way to go about these kinds of very complex, very we uncertain. Need, we need to avoid camps. Yeah. Uh, people should have their own opinions, and I think that this is welcome in a democracy, but when it comes to public health and protecting our health, uh, w- we need to be tolerant. We need to respect others. We, we need to avoid thinking that other people are our enemy. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that many of the measures that were taken created a sense that other people were a threat, that uh, you know they, they need to be avoided. Uh, we need to distance ourselves from them. Uh, we need to see them as sources of infection. Uh, if they have any questions about anything that we do, uh, they're arrogant, 
and they're wrong and they're weird and they're conspirator theories and uh, yeah. they, 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 they just need to be dissociated from the body of society. They, they need to be further marginalized. And, and unfortunately, I think that this led to marginalizing a very large number of people, um, probably preferentially people who were already marginalized to some extent or disadvantaged or had less opportunities compared to others. John, I'd go farther. I mean, I think the policy we adopted was if you couldn't have picked a policy better tailor-made to privilege the, the laptop class. Yeah. Like it was, a, it was a policy that only people that could afford to work from home without losing their job could benefit from. And for the rest of society, it was, it was, it was bound to create disaster. We, we, we see that in the data about fatalities, uh, COVID-19 fatalities in the U.S. We, if you stratify them by uh, racial background and educational attainment, we have data, unfortunately, that are mature only for the first year, but they show differences of 27-fold. So that was not a pandemic for everyone. It was yeah. a pandemic for some people who were sacrificed, and it was probably... Um, mostly vacation time for mm. some privileged people yeah. who you know, just continue to, to get their salaries, continue to do whatever they want to do. Uh, they had low wage people work for them and be exposed. I, I mean, I, I, I've been imagining or trying to imagine a, 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 a policy of focus protection that, that understands that there's a, a thousand fold difference or more in the risk of severe disease for oldest versus youngest. And I'm imagining what a, a response really focused on that could look like. We, so we use Uber Eats to deliver food to older people at home so they don't have to go out. We, we uh, make hotel rooms available when, um, when some, you know, like a, 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 a grandma is living in a house with a grandson, grandson calls and says, oh, I'm, I, I might have been exposed, grandma. Grandma calls pub local public health. Local public health then brings grandma to the hotel for a couple of days until grandson's cleared. I mean, we could have done an all of society approach with the mo the most important risk factor in mind, you know, old age. I mean, yeah. we could have we could have restructured our, our approach around that. And I, I mean, I don't. I'm not arguing. Don't spend the trillions of dollars we spent. I mean, I think a threat like this deserved a, a tremendous amount of expenditure. What I'm arguing for is exp expend it on where it would do the most good, would, where we'd integrate people together. In a, in, a, in, a, in, in a way to try to protect the people that are most vulnerable as opposed to privileging people who happen to be rich, who happen to have jobs that didn't require sacrifice anyways, and then pretend as if they're um, morally upright because they're able to, to comply with the orders. Yeah, there was a tremendous, like, there, I'm, I'm with Jay on this, there was a tremendous blowback from the laptop class of people that could afford to, to shelter in place and, and perhaps made a vacation about it. They probably ordered a home gym so that they could stay healthy while my gym was closed down by the mayor of DC. And um, then fast forward to um, vaccines are available and I, I think specifically of, of nurses, although there's a thousand examples of this, nurses who um, stuck their necks out and, and treated patients early on in the pandemic probably got sick themselves, developed natural immunity. They were, they were summarily fired for then deciding, perhaps, I, I think quite rationally, if, if I have natural immunity, maybe I don't need to be vaccinated. Um, so there is this have, have not thing. It's, it, it is a social justice issue um, in a way that, that I think is, is only now, I think we're now discovering just like who paid the price for these policies. If you've made it this far into the show, it means I must be doing something right. Kibbe on Liberty is just one of the amazing products we created for the people. We tell emotionally compelling stories and produce educational videos for the Liberty Curious. Our award-winning documentaries personalize all things Liberty, independence, creativity, hard work, integrity, and perseverance. After the show, check out our work at freethepeople.org. And if you like what you see, donate to support what we do. That's freethepeople.org. Now back to the show. I, I think that uh, we try to force a lot of mandates and uh, a lot of uh, actions that uh, the arguments seem to be very convincing, but very quickly 
they seem to uh, suffer from reality checks. Yeah. And, and people could notice these reality checks. Uh, f- for example, vaccines, you mentioned vaccines, they were an amazing development and they, they were developed so fast uh, that that's really a great victory for science. But we overpromised. We, we promised that these vaccines will just uh, do everything. They will not only protect people from dying, but they will just stop the pandemic. We will have no transmission and uh, everything will be fine again. And th- th- that was an overpromise. And it was very readily, obviously, <laughs> discovered by, by the average citizen that that yeah. was not the case. Yeah. So w- when we promise too much or, or when we say more than than is our share of evidence to say. We run the risk of losing a lot of people to that common effort. Yeah. And, and for public health, this is, this is a, a disaster. It, it's, it's not like science where it's okay to have people have very different arguments and very different perspectives and all contribute different kind of uh, aspects to, to a, a joint argument. In public health, you, you don't want to get people to become angry. You don't want them to to say that I don't believe in science, that I have been fooled, I have been mistreated, I have been, I have suffered because of science. That science is the best thing that can happen to humans. How can we let it be used in, in such a horrible way? Yeah. Y- you said something earlier I want to go back to because I think it's so essential. And Jay, you and I spoke about this last time. Um, you, you, you somewhat jokingly say that your entire career is a series of failures. And of what, you're, what you're really <laughs> saying is that the scientific process is iterations of theories and tests and failures and and other other colleagues pointing out like you do to them sometimes that that that's all wrong I can't replicate that the the data doesn't back that up um, that that is the scientific process um, properly understood that you're you're struggling constantly to try to figure out how the world actually works. Um, which gets to your point about um, these vaccines are a miracle, and if you take it and you do what you're told, you will never get sick and you will never get anyone else sick. Well, there, there was no evidence to back that up at the time, so they, they made a political statement that has absolutely undermined the credibility of, of science and public health. This is, this is very sad. I, th- I think that eventually it, it ended up giving uh, arguments to anti-vaxxers, uh, and I, th- I think that we can have repercussions that go way beyond the pandemic. Uh, different mandates, if, even if they're about things that we know for sure, for sure, <laughs> with, with an asterisk also, but you know, with very high certainty that they're going to be fine. They may help us for a little while, but they create a legacy of resistance among a number of people who just cannot work with, with mandates. I, mean, th- I think that the example of Sweden comes to mind. In Sweden, they did not mandate the COVID vaccine, and yet they had tremendously high uptake. It's a measure of the trust that people have in Swedish public health. When they made errors, they admitted it. When they, they course corrected. There's a deep trust between the, the people of Sweden and the public health agencies because they didn't feel like they were being told noble lies. The contrast with the United States couldn't be greater. Right, the, the the public health authorities in the United States have lost the trust of at least half the people, maybe more. Uh, and it's a tra- it's a, It basically means the public health cannot do its job. It, just like John said, it needs to be able to reach nearly everybody, be trusted by everybody. When you have a mandate, in my view, that mandate is evidence that public health has already failed. Yeah, yeah, and and the also the the rhetoric of. Um, People, parents that didn't want to vaccinate their four-year-old were called anti-vax. And it might have been completely something else, as in, I'm not sure this makes sense for my child. There's no, very little evidence that my child will get sick. Um, we don't have enough data to know how this will affect my child in the long term. And, and the, getting back to the tribes, that mom is now an anti-vaxxer and she's not at all. But the rhetoric might actually push her to start questioning the entire paradigm of vaccination, and that seems dangerous as well. I, I think that it comes back to that balancing act. Uh, yeah. How do we communicate with people without insulting them and without making them feel that they're threatened by the evidence? The evidence is going to help us, not threaten us. And uh, you know, vaccination in children, some of the, the best work was done by 
amazing colleagues at Stanford. So I'm, I'm very proud that, that uh, I'm, I'm in, in a university that has generated evidence on vaccines and on many other aspects of the pandemic. But when it comes to applying that evidence to real people, it's a very different thing. And you need to respect people. You need to inform them. You need to tell them what we know and what we don't know. Um, you need to acknowledge whatever uncertainty there exists. I, I cannot tell you what will happen 20 years down the road, of course, but reasonably thinking, I don't think that it will be a disaster. I can try to give you some sense about what are the benefits and what might be the potential risks and the uncertainty around them, and then you can decide. I think if, if we had done that, probably we would have had a better result in the short term and also a more secure legacy for public health in, in the future. I mean, clearly, unfortunately, in our country, we, we, we had horrible outcomes. If, if you look at excess death calculations, probably among the 35 uh, high-income countries that have the best uh, data on deaths, probably the U.S. is pretty much at the top. Um, why? 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 I think, I think it's, it's a composite of, of that failure on, on multiple levels. Um, Sweden you know, had its nursing homes devastated in the first wave. But overall, if you take two and a half years, they have a death deficit compared to pre-pandemic years. They have fewer deaths compared to what they had in quote unquote normal years. The same applies to about 10 out of the 33, 35 countries that we have the best, the most reliable data. But the US is so way off. And why? It's, it's not a recent problem. It's a chronic problem. The US was different even before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. All the other high income countries were improving their mortality rates over the last 10 years, from 2009 to 2019. They were going down. They had fewer deaths. If you adjust also for the aging of the population, you still see that there is declines in mortality. The US did not have that. We, we were pretty much stagnating. We had a, a chronic problem with our public health. We could not convince people, for example, that obesity is important. We have tremendously high levels of, of obesity in the population, among the highest, if not the highest, in, in the world. We have lots of people who are disadvantaged, lots of people who are very poor, lots of people who have poor access to care, lots of people who are, are just suffering every day, but they're, they're not visible to, to most of us. And they're a very easy target for any infectious disease, for any disease. And, and these are the people who mostly died during these last two and a half years. It was, yeah, it was a point. massacre revealing our, our chronic problems that w became acute in the setting of, of the panic and, and the crisis that we could not face because our public health had not been up to par. Let's uh, let's dig into excess deaths because this is important, and and um, I've I've listened to some of your talks where you talk about the infinite complexity of of defining um, what causes death and and trying to get data that makes sense. But what I'll ask uh, Jay first: Why so much excess death in the last two years? It's multifactorial. I mean, it's it's very difficult to pin on one one thing. Um, certainly, COVID played a, a role in, in, in the excess deaths. Uh, but we're also seeing excess deaths in young people who are not particularly subject to COVID in the United States. High levels of, you know, we had an opioid epidemic before the pandemic that continued and accelerated after the, during the pandemic. Um, we, we had um, uh, excess deaths from, um, from uh, uh, it, it, uh, if you look outside the US, from hunger. Huge numbers of people, millions of people starved during the pandemic as a consequence of the economic dislocation caused by the lockdowns. Um, the, we had in the United States and elsewhere levels of anxiety and depression that are, I mean, I think unprecedented in modern times, at least in peacetime. Um, and that also plays a role in, in uh, it plays itself out as, as, uh, as, as, as excess deaths. I, I don't, I, I guess I can't answer the question because I don't know the, the data. I don't think we know the data from the data exactly to, uh, parsed out what, what caused what, um, but when we what at the, at the end of the day, what I think what we'll find is uh, some of it COVID, a lot of it extended harms of lockdown. It's it's clearly a composite. It it's just uh, like getting an X-ray of our failure and and seeing all these multiple dimensions at play. 
And I, I think that uh, we, we need to be very careful to revisit objectively and see exactly what happened and where we lost so many lives because clearly the U.S. failed, failed mm -hmm. in, in big ways during yeah, these I, last I, two and I, a half years. Actually, I do think that some of it is, um, it, it revealed our, um, like the, the inadequacy of our social safety net to, to, to stress. Uh, a lot of the people that were at the bottom of the income distribution that didn't have good jobs, didn't, couldn't get take sick leave when they were sick, couldn't really, uh, I mean, they had to make the choice between leave, you know, leaving their kids home alone on Zoom or going to work um, because they were, they're essential worker. They didn't, they couldn't just take time off. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of that has been revealed as a, as, as a, as a major problem for the, for the underclass in the U.S., for the, for the, for the poor in the U.S. Um, and I think if you tie all of that together, what, what you see is, a po like I said before, a policy that was just almost tailor-made to privilege the rich, the, 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 the laptop class. It's just, and um, the fact that public health foursquare put itself behind such a policy, to me, is revealing. It's really revealing. And I, and I think um, if public health is ever going to gain the trust of the American people again, it's going to need to address that fact. It's going to need to acknowledge that it made that kind of instinctive error in favor of the privileged over the poor. Yeah, my, you know, my understanding, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, until quite recently, discussions about um, sweeping lockdowns, aggressive lockdowns, the kinds of things that, that China is still trying to implement, was, was broadly rejected by the public health community for what I would think are obvious reasons. Everything that we're talking about here, the collateral damage, the human damage, and yet, Almost overnight, lockdowns became the only acceptable solution. Why do you think that happened? It's very hard to, t to say, and I think that uh, it was not one person who made that decision. I think that it was a coalition, and, and it's not an organized coalition, of uh, lots of people who were scared, who were in panic. Uh, some were probably clearly thinking, but uh, with no data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So if you, if you have lots of people who are in panic, lots of people who are not thinking, and lots of people who are thinking but with no data, you have a perfect mix that you can make decisions that are catastrophic. And I think that this is what happened. I, I, as I told you in the very beginning of our discussion, when lockdown was proposed, I was among those who said, yes, and we have no clue. Let's do it until we find out what we are dealing with. But really we could get the data within just a couple of weeks uh, of to, to see what kind of virus we're dealing with, how rapidly it's spreading, what kind of risk stratification it had for different people in so different you were think groups. So you were thinking they were um, serious when they said two weeks to slow the spread? Well, I, I, I think that once you start that, th there's no obvious end. Yeah. There's still particularly politically, like if if you've taken that step, there's lots of people who have secondary gains and secondary aims and secondary thoughts about what it means to prolong that, mm -hmm. and it can easily get prolonged to two plus years. In China, it's still yeah. really the dominant strategy. It's not a single person. I I, I think that you have really a, a mass reaction of uh, both population level and scientific clans who organize around some particular way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And in the absence of solid data, you can easily justify everything. So in the early days of the pandemic, because we had limited hardcore data, we had tons of mathematical models. Yeah. Uh, I run mathematical models myself, probably mine among, are among the worst, <laughs> but uh, mathematical models are, are wonderful. I, I love them, but uh, they, they're a little bit like trying to uh, have a sketch on a sketchbook while well, real evidence is the Capella Sixtina. <laughs> and uh, somehow we thought that uh, these little sketches could be sold as the Capella Sixtina, yeah. or, or if not Michelangelo, at least Botticelli. So they were not. And, and we were seriously misled. A mathematical model, unless you're really very serious and very tough with yourself, you can make it work and show you right all the time, <laughs> you know, get get the result that you want to see and the inference that you want to see. Yeah. So I, I think that we just depended a lot on that. Politicians and policymakers had no clue on what is a mathematical model and what is a randomized trial, for example. They were both 
weird scientists. The mathematical modelers were a bit more weird. They sounded a little bit more fancy. So maybe we should believe them <laughs> rather than those who want to get more rigorous evidence. I, I'm, I'm doing some guesswork here. Yeah, but you know, there, there, w there was a literature on this, John. So there was, there was a, a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2020, actually, that uh, the, 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 the theme was policy contagion. Right, one country copied another after another, and there's and there's this element inside policy making. If you're if you're a, po a politician, you, you don't really you look at the evidence. You're like, this is too complicated. It looks very risky, no matter what I do. Uh, it's just easier, less risky if I just do what everyone else is doing. Then if it all goes wrong, I can't be blamed. Yeah. Right. So there's th so there you know you have a politician looking for a guru to tell them what to do. There, there's a group think among the gurus. People look at China and oh gosh, they, they, it's January 2020 and they solved the pandemic with a month lockdown. Uh, that idea, the, the mathematical models come out. The idea spreads among a relatively small group of people, yeah. in, who who then tell the politicians, look, if you don't do this, you're going to kill two million people in the United States, a half million people in in the UK, whatever, it's whatever the models say. Um, and then they say, okay, if I don't do this, I'm going to get blamed for two million people dying. It's safer if I just do this. Even if it goes wrong, I, at least I did the right thing. I, I think that you need to take into account the fact that in every democratic country you have people who say something and people who oppose that, b b b by definition. So the, the defensive approach is to just do the maximum because uh, in that way probably your opponents will have l fewer opportunities to say that you didn't do what you were supposed to do. The, the, the second problem is that you can have scientists who know a lot, you know, they're, they're tremendously knowledgeable or, or give the sense that they're tremendously knowledgeable in their, their science itself. Right. And scientists who are, are very reserved, very skeptical, you know, John Yanidis, most of my published research findings are wrong. Uh, I'm going to tell you about uncertainty. I don't really know. So, you know, who is going to be more favored by a politician or a policymaker who wants to act right away? I'm John Yanidis, who yeah. doesn't know anything and he's an idiot? Forget it. I, I will take this guy who is science himself and he knows everything about science and society and public health and he's our savior. So, so uh, I, I think that it's unavoidable. Science, if you want to do it right, it takes some time. Yeah. I'm and thinking it takes some thought. <laughs> At Kibbe on Liberty, freedom is a lifestyle 24-7, something you live and breathe and wear every day. If that describes you, you need the very best Liberty swag in the market today, just like this shirt I happen to be wearing. Go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and check out our exciting merch. You too can love Liberty and look cool. You, you probably know this this infamous exchange between Matt Ridley and Neil Ferguson early in the pandemic talking about the Imperial College model. And, and I'm, I'm not going to quote directly because I, I can't remember that stuff, but I feel like every time Matt Ridley, who's a fairly smart guy, he's fairly informed, um, every time he had uh, uh, Neil Ferguson in a corner, he would say something to the effect of, oh, it's really, really too complicated to explain. <laughs> and and to me that's a that's a tell that that perhaps um, perhaps it's uh, there's a there's a science term bullshit um, I don't know but this gets to the modeling question and this this is your thing and I I, I want to um, get into this and I, you don't need to pick on the Imperial College model but that infamously came up with those massive numbers that scared politicians into doing the most risk averse thing politically. Whether or not it was the risk averse thing in, uh, from a public health perspective, it is a very real thing where politicians feel an obligation to say, I did everything that I possibly could. Don't blame me, I tried. Mm -hmm. um, versus taking the more modest approach of, of you know, let's, let's not do damage here until we understand. Um, and um, I remember, and this, this goes to something that Phil Magnus at AIR has written about extensively, the, the assumptions and what amounts to a, a physics model, a mathematical model, that, that is utterly lacking in data, and this was, this was your early critique of this model. So I Imperial College is a nice example because they're an, an amazing team. They, they, they have scientists that they're among the best in the world, if not the best in the world, in mathematical modeling and infectious diseases. And, and their models were, were 
really a, a highly professional effort to, to get some numbers and some estimates, and they did that in, in real time. So, so Shapoba, I mean, they're, they're, they're amazing, and they did that, I think, with the best intentions. A an asterisk, though, is that their, their model that was the most famous one and that uh, eventually suggested that we need to go into lockdown, and then uh, their same line of work estimated that by lockdown, just in the first wave, we saved more than three million lives in Europe alone. Actually, that very same team, Imperial College, had worked on another model at the very same time, which they applied on data from the states, from, from US states, and which could be applied also to European countries. So we did apply that model to European countries' data, and we saw that with that other model from Imperial College, lockdown did not save any lives. It was far more simple things that made a difference, uh, far more disru l less disruptive things that, that could do the trick just as well. Yeah. Actually, the second model that showed that lockdown had no benefit in saving lives had a much better fit to the data. But what was published was the model that suggested that lockdown saved millions of lives. Th this is something that I had seen again and again and again in my experience as a researcher and researcher on research that very often we selectively report, we, we cherry pick mm -hmm. results that are more in line with what we think, with what we have in mind, with what seems to make sense to us. With, with good intentions, not that someone's paying us. Well, sometimes <laughs> there may be industry, well, there may be say is, other conflicts. Is, it, is there possibly an incentive to come up with big, scary results? And is, is there, well, is there finances that flow? Let me, let me get an example. Well, I, I, don't, I think yes. Uh, but like, <laughs> but, but, but uh, let me just give you an example of, the, of what happens when somebody tries to say, well, let's slow down and think about this, right? So my, my colleague, Sunetra Gupta at Oxford University, who I wrote, with whom I wrote the Great Barrington Declaration, she wrote a, a, f a beautiful paper. She's, she's a mathematical epidemiologist. She wrote a beautiful paper in March of 2020 about, about the modeling. And in particular, she, she, it, 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 the, 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 her model is like kind of a meta model where you can, it, it, it incorporates many possible models. Um, and and the, the, I, the, the, what she found was that you could, you could have one of two things that are consistent with the data on March 2020. Either the disease is fairly widespread, um, but not very deadly per person, uh, you know, with the same age gradient, or it's not that widespread and incredibly deadly for the people that are infected, but, but, but slow to spread. B both were possible with the, the data that were available in March 2020 according to this meta model that Sinatra Gupta had come up with, she and her team had come up with. Um, and uh, the Imperial College model and so many of the models that got all the attention assumed in the absence of the data that the world was like a very deadly disease that w had spread relatively slowly, not a, a disease that spread very widely w that wasn't very deadly. The truth, I think, turned out to be somewhere in between. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't Ebola, uh, but it, at the same time, it wasn't the seasonal flu. As I recall, it also assumed that um, people faced with radical uncertainty and the threat of a um, unknown and potentially very deadly disease would not change their behavior one mm. bit. And, uh, and maybe that's a, a flaw in the economics of the model because obviously human behavior yeah. and the human response to uncertainty is, is a key part of, of trying to project anything, which is why uh, my brand of economics is quite critical of trying to force human behavior into what amounts to a physics model. Human behavior is very difficult to model and it, it can play tricks with us all the time, especially in models that end up being too deterministic. And I think that uh, we've we've learned that uh, the hard way during the pandemic. We we, we knew that. <laughs> yeah, I worked <laughs> on models like that before. I think that, that we we learned it in a very nasty way during the pandemic when all these models started to collapse one, one after another, and uh, eventually people just decided that uh, well maybe we should scale back in terms of what we can do and what we can predict. Yeah. Maybe just a week or two, <laughs> at the most, and maybe we should just join forces instead of having just one team. Even though they might be the best scientists in the world, just have multiple teams compare notes and make their predictions, and then see how well they perform 
after t one or two weeks and then calibrate again and again and again. So we've learned uh, the hard way that there are things that we cannot predict well, yeah. that there are things that are out of our control, that there are things that we cannot anticipate, that, that uh, especially when it comes to human populations, they're free people. <laughs> and they, they, they can behave in, in ways, hopefully, <laughs> that, that we cannot fully control. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think like the, uh, the, that, that human behavior aspect of it is absolutely central to models. That's actually a major theme of, of, of some of the work that I worked on pre before the, the pandemic was this, uh, w was this response to the fear of of uh, infectious disease, like what do you, what what do you do in that context? And of course, what you do depends on your resources, how scared you are. Um, someone who has the capacity to lock themselves down because they're scared, you don't have to tell them. You don't have to force them to lock down. They'll just do it. Someone who you tell to lock down, you have to keep your kid home from school. Uh, even if they're scared, they won't be able to do it because they care more about their child than they care about about you know the the, the virus. They'll go go out in work and try to d and, and get sick even though they're, they're, they're vulnerable because they need to feed their family. I mean, those kinds of complexities, um, it's very difficult to put into those models. But if you don't, you're not, you're going to overestimate the effect of a, effectiveness of a, uh, of a formal lockdown. And you're going to misunderstand the distributional effects of the policies you end up putting in place. It's a form of uh, scientism. And, and we've, we talked about this, but um, scientism is a is a term that Frederick Hayek came up for um, critiquing um, economists that wanted to take some of the tools of the of the hard physical sciences and apply them to human behavior. But I I feel like we've gone even further. And when I'm when I'm looking at critiques of of the modeling, it seems to be almost pretending that there's a certainty to this process that absolutely doesn't exist. In, in the physical sciences, um, that seems dangerous. And it, it gets to this point of undermining science itself, this, this beautiful process. The reason that we're probably all still alive at this table is science. Um, and we've just done so much damage. But, you know, the thing, the thing is, is like, to, like take that Imperial College model. It, it could have been used in a really pretty way, right? Instead of using it to scare the living daylights out of everybody, it could have it could have been used to say, okay, well, uh, what are the key uncertainties? Like, what are the what what would he need to learn immediately so that we can design our response better? It's so it's it's the same mathematical structure. It's the same paper, even um, maybe without the without the the urge to lock down at the end of it, um, and that it produces something very constructive. It could have been used that way, but it, w w it wasn't actually used that way. It was used in a very I, different I, way. I want to play the devil's advocate, though, because th that might be a scientific approach. Uh, and for policy making and for decision making, um, people who are not scientists will make the decisions, and, and they cannot tolerate uncertainty. So uh, it, it could be that scientists are trying to communicate uncertainty, and, and then the policymakers see that, no, no, this is. Uh, trivia. I, I don't want to hear about that. Just just tell me <laughs> what yeah. to do. Just give me a number and tell me what to do and how to act. And then on, on top of that, you have other entities who uh, see that the crisis is happening and they try to take advantage of it. For sure. And uh, that could be every single person <laughs> trying to get advantage for their own benefit. And there's nothing wrong about that. I want to save my life and I I want to prosper, and that applies to every single person on planet Earth or 8 billion people. And then you have entities with other types of conflicts uh, who also want to make money or who want to, to become more visible or more prestigious or, or get more clients or, or, or find a way to support whatever they do. But John, the way, the way, to, way to address your, your point, and which is completely fair, right? So like pe you, you have an audience of policymakers who are not comfortable with uncertainty. Um, the way to address that is you systematically include a wide set of gurus or voices who are bound to disagree with each other, right? Like a, 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 a panel of people who are, uh, are going to tell you their, 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 their minds uh, and disagree openly. And that's the advice that you give to the, to the king or to the, to the, the, the policymaker. I mean, you, you, don't, uh, you don't put at, uh, you don't take a, 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 a science bureaucracy, take a small number of people at the top of it, a car small cartel of people at the top of it, uh, and then privilege them as their voices as correct and everyone else as fringe. 
that's that's a recipe for disaster if they turn out to be wrong. It's a, I mean, there's a natural selection bias in politics because this is more my world, like trying to figure out how to um, limit the power of government so that it doesn't feel like it can fix every single problem because there's this selection bias where in economics, and I think I suspect the same as in public health, that the the people that rise to the top in the in the agencies and and the advi- the presidential advisors are people that speak with absolute certainty about things that um, in the in the case of economics there are there are plenty of things that um, public policy can't solve. You have to get out of the way and let people solve those problems. And and I suspect that's true in public health and almost every aspect of government. There's there's a lot of overconfidence I think yeah. uh, in um, in our strengths. <laughs> it's almost demanded, it, like the performance. But Charlie, I, th- I think that's okay. I mean, I don't. I, I think like a, 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 you have two p- sets of overconfident people, <laughs> <laughs> and they're fighting with each other uh, with the mm-hmm. with like different. I mean, uh, and you have somebody f- whom you're trying to convince. That's a much healthier place to be than where you have one set of overconfident people. You have the advisor and. The overset set of confident, overconfident people manage to push away everybody else so that the advisor never hears or the, the, the legislator never hears that there's even an alternate point of view at all. Yeah, I, I agree this would be more healthy, but I, I think we need to consider uh, realism in, on how things work and how mm-hmm. people want to get uh, just a single recommendation rather than a mix of <laughs> yes, but if uh, perhaps uh, possible. <laughs> uh, it, it just doesn't sound like an action plan. And it's also very susceptible to attacks from oppositions uh, of all sorts that, uh, well, you're not decisive. You're not really giving a clear message. You're, you're very vague and convoluted. Now, when it comes to science, I, I think allowing for the full debate is, is clearly essential. I think it's also clearly essential to allow people to move their position in that debate, especially in conditions where evidence is mm. so thin or, or so weak. I, I, I don't feel that people should just uh, hide themselves behind their castle of, you know, this is my opinion and I will defend it at all costs until yeah. I die. Uh, this is also my reservation uh, about efforts to put scientists in the same bin, uh, including, you know, petitions or, or open letters, uh, which I know that you have led <laughs> such a very glorious <laughs> effort. Still I, proud I, of that, John. I, Sure. Right. Good <laughs> my dying day. Try to convince you to sign it, but I know it won't, won't work. <laughs> it's 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 just that I, I I feel that scientists should be free to to change their minds to to say that uh, well uh, today based on what I have seen I think that lockdown is a horrible thing and it, you know devastating. But can you convince me to the opposite? I'm I'm ready to be convinced to the opposite. I, I don't want to feel that I have signed away my name uh, on, <laughs> on, on any open letter or petition that uh, th- this has it's always okay, been John, my okay, John, we can faith. still be friends. It's fine. <laughs> well, you, 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 do sign, you do sign your name every time you publish an article that, that will then yes, turn but, out but, to but be but not exactly it, right. But then uh, it could be entirely wrong, uh, and, and then I can take responsibility for that. But it's different when you try to get many scientists to, to be on the same wavelength. Right. Yeah, and, and it's even more problematic when you have a crisis because uh, people may have second thoughts on why they sign. For example, if, if I have a chairman of a department or a dean sent out an email that, uh, you know, please sign this letter because we want to save lives. Yeah. And it is about a policy position based on some science. That's very tricky because an assistant professor is, is going to think, well, I, I'm not going to be promoted or I, I will have my dean or my department chair not want to yeah. <laughs> see me again yeah. <laughs> if, I if I say I defy you and I'm not going to sign this this letter no. it's, it's it's not easy this is not theoretical I, I was actually subject to such a letter uh, <laughs> at Stanford uh, by by my colleagues who didn't like that I uh, told Governor DeSantis that uh, that uh, there was no randomized evidence saying that children tr- masking children had any effect on the pandemic which is an absolute true fact um, and a uh, hundred of my colleagues put out a letter asking the, the, the president of the university to silence me or to censor me because I'd said that to him. To him. I mean, it's just, and, and, and John, you're absolutely right. Uh, for an s- assistant professor to get that letter from the chair of the department is very coercive. Yeah. But something like the Gate Branton Declaration, 
I can go, I, can't, I can't even <laughs> course my friends to sign it. R- remind, I mean, remind, like, uh, just for people, that there's probably three people in the world that don't know what the Great Barrington yeah, Declaration is. <laughs> just r- remind us quickly. Uh, yeah, so it was, it was a, uh, a, a, a proposal that I wrote with uh, Sunetra Gupta, who we talked about earlier, and Martin Kuldorf, of, of, of then of Harvard University, uh, the, in October of 2020, where we proposed a very different strategy from lockdown. We proposed a focus protection strategy for, for older people um, while, for example, opening schools and, and allowing something closer to normal life to go on for, for less risky populations. Yeah. Um, almost a million people, regular people signed it, tens of thousands of scientists have signed it. I, I gotta tell you, uh, Matt, I'd never written or signed a petition before in my life. It was my <laughs> first and probably gonna be my last. Um, uh, but, but I, the reason was very specific. My, my view was that 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 that, that this, this well obviously I believe it was the right policy, but also that that this the discussion over the lockdown had gotten to the point where it seemed to the public eye that lockdown was the scientific consensus. When I knew for a fact it wasn't, I knew there were prominent scientists. I mean, of, of lo- all, lots of different types that had that had reservations, maybe for different reasons than I did about lockdown, and that favored a policy that was more targeted, uh, and that wasn't getting sufficient attention, in my view, in, in the public eye. And so the, the purpose of the Great Barrington Declaration was to tell the public that, that in fact the public discussion, which appeared so one-sided from a scientific point of view, was not actually so one-sided, that actually there was a lot of scientific discussion that was still going on, and the public was getting a false picture of the unanimity behind uh, the, 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 the lockdown policy. So um, we should give a shout-out to the American Institute for Economic Research. This is why we've all gathered in Dallas, d- uh, Dallas today. And there's a dinner tonight, and you are receiving an award. And I, I copied this because I want to read it. Um, you're winning the Harwood Prize for Intellectual Courage, which is given to an intellectual leader in any field of study or profession who exercises unusual courage in standing up for what is true under difficult circumstances. And I want to wrap up this conversation by first congratulating you. Um, Thank you. And second, um, I've heard both of you talk about this before, but um, give us a sense for the price. This was not fun. They went after you. They went after your family. Um, well, I, I think that uh, I'm, I'm greatly honored uh, to, to receive the, the Harwood uh, Prize. and. Uh, I, I feel that there's 30 million scientists in, in the world and probably all of them would be better qualified than, than I am in terms of, of courage or in terms of intellectual uh, excellence. I, I consider myself uh, someone who knows next to nothing. I have put that for many years now. You in know, my Socrates used to say this, John. Yes. Just well, like we Socrates <laughs> said that I... It's, I, it's a bit I, of a I, humble I brag. I know one thing that I know nothing. No, so Socrates uh, was serious arrogant. and so was John. <laughs> I'm very arrogant. I say that I know next to nothing. So you know, maybe I, <laughs> I know little bits and pieces here and there. And in in terms of courage, I I don't feel that I'm a very courageous person. I I I'm afraid of the flu every uh, winter. I try to avoid it. Usually I I get it just as well. <laughs> um, and uh, if I do get it, I I'm a horrible patient. Uh, you know, even with a, a minor flu, I my wife can tell that uh, uh, I don't really tolerate it uh, that well. But um, I, I think that probably th- people thought that uh, I have <laughs> been uh, a maverick in, in uh, coming up with uh, some ideas that perhaps many of them were wrong and sometimes maybe some were, were correct to question different things, to question possible mistakes, prominently my own mistakes, and try to correct them. I, I really feel that science is that wonderful iterative process that defies dogma and tries to get things right, and eventually tries to get things right to help people. Okay, I, I really I don't care about the, the price of death threats and uh, all sorts of, uh, of attacks that I have received. Uh, Are you still getting death threats? Um, not today. Uh, <laughs> not till not til this show publishes, I suppose. <laughs> okay, can I just, I think I found finally something where I deeply disagree with John. Uh, Courage is something that that is a, is a quality of character that that comes from a, of countless decisions and actions taken over a lifetime. I, I don't know of anyone more intellectually courageous than John. It's been a, an absolute honor to be able to work with him. 
Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, the key thing is somebody who is willing to say, this is what I think. This is, this is what I don't know. This is what I, I don't know of a better example of that kind of courage than John's. Because in this environment where we're, we're asking for the guru, we're asking for the person who's always right, you, what you're going to get from John is, here's what, we, what I think I know. Here's what I think we should do to like, improve that knowledge. And then when it comes out that there are parts that he knew that was right and parts that he knew that wasn't right, he'll tell you that. And I've seen that firsthand. I, I, I see myself mostly as an idiot. Uh, and idiot is a, is a Greek word. Uh, it means what is, of course, uh, well known in English, someone who's completely a fool. But also in, in ancient Greek and in modern Greek is the person who follows his own personal private path uh, unperturbed <laughs> yeah. by the sirens and by uh, pressure and by declarations uh, <laughs> or, or ideologies or, or outsider and insider <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say, your, your <laughs> metaphor, I think, explains the mindset of, of, of potentially being corrupted by being inside. It'll cloud your judgment. So Sometimes. I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm going to call myself an idiot now. That sounds like a good <laughs> thing. Yeah. Thank you both. And um, quickly, where, Jay, where do we find your work and the Great Barrington Declaration and all that good stuff? So I, for the last year, I found myself uh, on Twitter, which is, uh, you know, after, after a lifetime of telling my assistant professors not to join Twitter, I find myself on Twitter all the time. Um, so I'm D Dr. D-R-J, just the letter J, Bhattacharya, B-H-A-T-T-A-C-H-A-R-Y-A. -T -T on Twitter. How about you, John? I have no social media. Uh, I, I love people who are so smart. That's why you're and, smiling right and now. Wise. <laughs> <laughs> but, and <laughs> but John has published 60 papers during the pandemic? I've, I've polluted the COVID-19 uh, literature so you with can about find 60 peer-reviewed papers. You, you can find them on a special page on my Stanford web profile, along with more than a thousand other papers that I have polluted the rest of the literature. So. Uh, really horrible, but whoever is interested, <laughs> yes, they, they can and, take And the American look. Institute for Economic Research has a nice write-up of you on their website, and, and you shouldn't read it because you'll, you'll be embarrassed by it. So <laughs> thank you both. This has been fantastic. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for watching. If you liked the conversation, make sure to like the video, subscribe, and also ring the bell for notifications. And if you want to know more about Free the People, go to freethepeople.org.